Hi everyone, John Aldridge here with episode three of Aldo Meets the Podcast in conjunction with Hotel Anfield. Along this year, we're going to be joined by some fantastic uh, personalities to do with Liverpool Football Club and beyond. And, you know, we will see what happens. Uh, Dave Coit being the latest one who's going to join us. Um, but I'd like to thank all the sponsors, and this is very important because uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, Budweiser Brewery. Bell Lamb, Joyce and Solicitors, Liverpool Connect, Airport Transfers, Olympic Scaffold uh, and Tower Eye, Kingdom Plumbing, Northwest Fencing, Onyx Real Estate, Dortmunder Brewery, and it's all in support of Zoe's Place and the Owen McVeigh Foundation. So thanks very much to all of them. I had to write it down because I'm useless, I can't remember. So uh, let's have a, a good podcast with the... I'm sure you really enjoy it because he's top man. And uh, I'll see you next time. Hello, everyone. Aldo here for the third episode of Aldo Meets Podcast in conjunction with Hotel Anfield. This season, we're going to have some great guests. I've heard of that before, Steve Nichol and Jamie Carragher. And we have a guest today who I'm delighted to have back into Liverpool. The one and only, the cult hero, Dirk Cows, who lived just, just down the road from where I was from in a slightly bigger house than what I had. <laughs> it was actually a school. It used to be a school, but it was a fantastic property. Dear, great to see you, mate. Very happy to, to be you. here. We also have Peter <coughs> Schwarzenegger. <laughs> <laughs> and James Pierce, uh, my, my good mates, who are going to help me along here today's show. Dirk, how, how does it feel to be back in Liverpool? Must bring back a lot of memories. Yeah, no, it's always nice uh, to be uh, to be back. To be honest, I'm you know trying to come as much as possible, and to be fair, uh, to travel from Amsterdam to uh, to Liverpool is it's just a 55 minutes flight. So uh, very happy to be back, and also uh, nice that I could bring my son. He's uh, 16 years old, and uh, we travelled on Friday. It was exactly 60 years ago then uh, when I made the. You know the the two goals against Everton, especially you know the last penalty was a, a good one to win the game at Goodison Park. So special memories uh, to be back. What did you make in the Merseyside derby? Uh, well, it was a I, I think a difficult game for for Liverpool. Uh, very happy with the result, obviously, but you now to to play good games sometimes you need you know two very good teams. And from what I saw from Everton yesterday, already with eleven men, that they were playing so defensively. Mm. Um, and they did even more with 10. So uh, happy with the result. Uh, the, f the performance could be better, but uh, yeah, I think Liverpool is doing really well so far. I, th I think with, with, with derbies in particular, you've been there, I've been there. It's, it's not really about the performance. It, it just comes down to the results. Yeah. It's just the fact that Everton showed Liverpool uh, too much respect, if anything, you know, uh, for me. You know, the derbies that I played in and, and, and she did. Evan used to have, a, have to have a go because the fans, you know, demanded that. But, uh, but yesterday's game, it was, and I've been watching derbies since the mid-60s. That's, that's a sport that ever since the team I've seen for a long time. You still got to beat them. You know, we, we always play well or tend to play well at home games where the teams have a go and leave us a little bit of space. But they were just so compact. And move like that, and it, it's really tough as, as they know to, to break down. So, at the end of the day, you need a mistake or, or a piece of genius, you know, to, to win the game. And, and yes, these was a mistake with the handball, we got and it was a penalty, don't get me wrong. And, and the rest is history, but just to, for the fans' point of view, get the one nil to two one, get the scrappy result, get the three points, and walk away in it. Yeah, definitely true. And um, I think Liverpool had the best possibilities in, in the, in the counter attacks. Yeah. So when Everton had a corner kick, that was Liverpool's best possibility to score. So we had a few opportunities, but uh, like Aldo was saying, like back in the days, it was more of a fight. You know, yeah. Everton doesn't matter if you play at Goodison Park or at Anfield; they always had a go at you, and it was a real fight. Um, and then you know, obviously, you want a result get in, but you know, the team I saw yesterday, they, they Everton, they were just holding up. They were not mm -hmm. asked to even try to win the game. They would be very happy with a nil-nil, and that's. In my opinion, not how a derby should be played. Yeah, absolutely. What, what are you up to these days? Then tell us a bit about life after playing. What are you? What what, what kind of takes up your time? You're in coaching, one. Yeah, you're yeah coaching, no, I've, I've I've done my batches. So uh, after my career finished at Feyenoord, 
um, I jumped straight in to get my batches done. Um, done that for a couple of years. It took me three, four years also. Corona was there, so it took me a little bit longer. Um, in the meantime, I was um, coaching the under-19s of Feyenoord. Mm. And um, last year or last season, I had my first opportunity as a, a first team manager. It didn't work out quite well. And now I'm looking for new opportunities. I had a puzzle, uh, a couple of possibilities, but it did was the right, you know, the right moment. Um, and, you know, as in football, everything can change by the day. So, you know, mm -hmm. the first managers are getting sacked and the new opportunities are coming. But for me, it's really important that my second job as a manager have to be a good one. So uh, looking forward to that. And in the meantime, traveling a lot, uh, doing a lot of work for Liverpool Football Club which give me the possibility to travel, to meet new people, to connect with people and uh, yeah, enjoy do, my do, life. Do, do, do you go to different environments to, to look at different coaching methods in, yeah. in, in Ireland, the different teams or, or clubs or whatever? To, yeah, just definitely. To, when you go back in. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I always um, been in good contact with, with Louis van Gaal, who was my okay. manager at the Dutch national team. Arne Slot, who is uh, at yeah. the moment doing very well at Feyenoord, he was, mm. you know, almost taking the the job at uh, Spurs last season, uh, and obviously I'm watching uh, Liverpool. Uh, Jurgen, I think he's, you know, a great inspiration for all of us, and especially for, you know, uh, uh, young managers like me. Um, and sometimes I have contact with with Pep, who is a who is a great mm -hmm. Dutch guy, and I think, uh, yeah, a very important. Uh, uh, you know, help for, for Jürgen as well. So, mm. of course, I look into uh, different uh, type of uh, coaches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it make, when, when things don't work out in your first management job, does that make you even more wary about what the next challenge is you mm. take on? Because you think you know, if, it, if it didn't work out again, then, you know, that, that might, mm. then there might not be a third ch yeah. chance. Well, it, it, it makes it more difficult, but, you know, um, uh, that's interesting because in, in America, they love, you know, people who fail, as they say, like mm. fail, because they get the experience mm. um, in, in, in the jobs they are doing. Uh, but in football, as everyone knows, you are as good as your last game. Mm. And even as a manager, you can lose three games and you're out. Mm. So you live a little bit by the day. But for me, definitely, the next step I take needs to be a good one. So that's why I you know, turn some jobs down and it needs to be yeah. a really, a really good one. But I learned so much uh, from that almost year experience at Ado Den Haag that I'm sure it will help me in, in, in my, my next job. And of course, you're making uh, mistakes as a as a young manager, but I think every young manager uh, are yeah. making mistakes and that's, that's you know, something what you need to learn of. Which leads us on nicely uh, <laughs> to one of the next question, which is some of your ex-teammates uh, um, have uh, turned to uh, coaching and maybe some that you would have expected they would go into coaching haven't. So Xabi Alonso is doing actually really well mm -hmm. at Bayer Leverkusen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, obviously there is like a bit of a discussion about if he might be suitable one day to even succeed Jurgen Klopp. Like, did you have him down as someone who would go into management? Did he make that clear at the time already? Well, I, I was discussing it yesterday with my son because we, we love to watch football in every part of Europe. So, of course, we follow the German league as well. And um, um, am I understanding it right that my son was saying they are, that they are top of the league in yeah. the Bundesliga? They're also doing, I think, really well in Europe. So uh, Xabi is doing definitely something right. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing right, you know, people straight away yeah. you know, start saying, oh, he should be the new Liverpool manager yeah. or a manager at another top club in Europe. But uh, I think um, his development is he's, he's, he's doing very well. And hopefully, you know, he, he will get better and better. But from Xabi back in the days, uh, as you see with a lot of midfield players, you could see already he was a coach on the pitch. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, in my opinion, he will be uh, yeah, a very, a very good manager. But for me, you know, Stevie is also a very good manager. He's, he, he has done such a great job at Glasgow Rangers. Didn't work out at uh, Villa, but that's what sometimes happened to, to managers. And now he's doing a job in the Middle East. I think people are criticizing him a lot because of that. But at the end of the day, you have to look to his quality. You know, as a person and as a manager, and for me, definitely, he's also still one of the yeah. people who can can be in the future a manager of Liverpool. Um, that haven't been said. Uh, I think Jurgen will still be for 
a longer time because there's hope there's <laughs> hope such a great connection you know we need we need Ola to do her magic again and convince <laughs> him to stay a bit yeah. longer what about Jamie Carragher from your point of view you know because he's a big character he's had a big influence on the team at the time is it somewhat surprising for you that he just ended up never going into management at all or uh well definitely uh, he has a great vision of the game uh but already you know when he was a player I, i didn't see him as a coach i don't think he because if you want to become a coach you have to be really dedicated to you know the world of football um we've done that as a player for most of us for 20 years and day in day out everything is football when you become a coach maybe you spend even more time on football and you know some of the players don't want to do that uh, although Uh, Kara is a you know loving loving football you know you can see that in his work on the television mm. but mm. I think he was never into to coaching because uh, he also wants a bit of a life yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's doing and he's, yeah. he's doing that I saw his father <laughs> yesterday and he was enjoying himself as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, you, you, know, you played under some great managers you know both the club level and international level who's the best tactician Uh, I'm, I'm motivated, or is the one that stands out above them all, or you, you you put a bit of every like if you go into management, like when I went into management, I probably based most of my management on, on Jack Charlton being under him for 10 years. You know, uh, you let you also learn some 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 great advice with, with other managers. You take try to take a little bit of each one and, and put it into like like baking a cake, get the right ingredients if, it, yeah. if, it, if it, that makes sense. Like where where would that stand with you with the managers that that you you played under? Well, well, for me, you know, Rafa was really important important for me. He brought me to to Liverpool, and he's one of the best managers I ever had. But mm -hmm. I tell you a story about Louis Van Gaal. Um, it was in 2014, the World Cup, and um, it was already the time. You know, you get sent a video about your opponent. You know, where his weaknesses are, where his yeah. strengths are, and. I have to come to his room. We played uh, Mexico in the last 16. The day before, he said, listen, I said, you're going to play. We will play 5-3-2. And now, normally, I'm a striker. I was playing as a left fullback. And he said, okay, you're going to start on the left fullback. And I expect this, this, mm -hmm. this from you. He said, but I'm not really happy about the guy on the right side. So if he's not doing well, the second half, you play on the right. He said, but don't forget, if we come in behind, you know, mm -hmm. I still want to You put you in as a target man because then we need to score a goal and you're really important as well. So mm. focus on that if that comes to to your <laughs> mind. And if we are, you know, leading the game, we're gonna change the system back to four three three. So I need to play you as a right back in four defense. I said, okay, coach. So he sent me all the clips. It was it was a meeting of more than an hour, and I was like, whatever. The next day, I start the game on the left, half time. He changed the guy. I go to the right. We we were um, uh, getting beat one 0 Go up front. We were winning. Going back. So <laughs> the best coaches, you know, prepare every detail, and he already detailed every you know possibility in the game, and that's what's making you, I think, a really good manager. And I think that's how Jurgen Klopp is working. But also, I had it many times with Rafa. He told me so many, you know, small, very small details. What occasionally made a big difference in games. It's for, like Jack Shaw, uh, what a character, what a great, great man. Uh, he, he always used to say, as a, a centre-half, he hated anything in behind. Everything there or right. So he, we, had, we played long tactics, long ball tactics, and, and I learned an awful lot from, from that, But in, in, especially in great areas, putting the ball behind. But he had his flaws because he used to be a little bit forgetful. And I always remember this uh, this time and in the dress room at Lansdowne Road in Dublin. Uh, and we're in there and, and Jack gets his team sheets out like this. He's got it on a bit of paper. He puts his glasses on like that. He's all like that. Yeah, in goal, right back. There we go. Midfield. There we go. And, and we're all looking at each other thinking, that's not right. And Tony Cascarino was there and he's gone, Jack, you've named 12 players. And he went, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you're not fucking playing. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he said it. Yeah. It was so funny. <laughs> and we all just hey, we, we went on the pitch and we still won like no. Yeah. That was Jack Charlton for yeah. you. You know, he's, he's, a, oh, he's a great man. He's a great man. But he's very forgetful at times. 
<laughs> a question for both of you, really. As, as strikers, what approach from managers brought out the best in you? Did, did you need someone to like to, to fire you up or was it an arm around the shoulder? What, what worked best? Mm. Uh, for me, it was just confidence. So as, as soon as the manager gives you like confidence, I had it when I um, was transferred from Utrecht to Feyenoord. And uh, the first meeting I had with the coach was Bert van Marwijk. He was also the national team coach. Uh, we reached the World Cup final in 2010. I came to him, had the first meeting. He said, you know, welcome to the club. You know, I don't know what position I'm going to put you, but you are my first name on the team sheet. So when a coach says that to you, mm. you have the you know confidence that you you are able you know to give everything on the pitch and yeah to feel yourself comfortable and do the, do the job you have to do for the team. How about you, John? What, did, what worked best for you? Um, in what way? Just in terms of bringing out the best in you. The um, pint. Do you know what? <laughs> <laughs> No, Sometimes a hot it. coffee will do it. Yeah. 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 Would, that, that'd be a nice start, wouldn't it? We'll solve that. Uh, we'll solve I don't that. know. It's, it's funny. I remember I remember playing for Oxford and um, we playing Gillingham in, in, in a cup. Uh, and, and the manager said, I need, I need a word with you, John. So he took me out and I thought, I hadn't scored for a couple of games, but I, I'd, I still scored like a lot of goals in the season. And he went, I was thinking of, of, of maybe leaving it out tonight. And I've gone, why? He said, because, you know, you're, you're not doing it. I said, Morris, I said, look at me going to the game record. I said, you're having a laugh. I said, yes. and I went, no, and I was just, he said, but, you know, I'm going to give you, you know, I'm giving you another chance. And I'm thinking, yeah, gee, I'm thinking, because I was confident, you know what I mean? I thought, yeah. anyway, we won 6-0 and scored four. That's good management. Yeah, because I didn't realise that I probably had dipped. Yeah, you know what I mean. Maybe it's a slight bit of bad arrogance, but which I'm not an arrogant person or whatever reason. But he's seen it and he's pulling me and he's just giving me a little kick up the arse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This day and age, with some players, you can't do that because it's a different world we live in now. Uh, but that was really good, you know, yeah. because and so I know managers of today it's different because in the old school you give it to them all, you give it to them all. Some places today, with all due respects, can't take it. No. So yeah, you have to individually. When when Dick knows that now, when he goes back into the game as a manager, you've got to see what different how you you approach different players. Mm. That makes the job even harder, you know. It really is, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's the first part of the show um, of Aldo Meets podcast with the you make Dick James, and I'll get his name right one and get his swag <laughs> under <laughs> Well, Dirk, let's take you back to where it all started when you were growing up as a kid. I know your, your dad was a fisherman, wasn't he? And was yep. there an almost an expectation that you would potentially follow in his footsteps? Yeah, yeah. No, my um, uh, my father was a fisherman. Uh, lots of people around me were fishermen. My granddad was a fisherman, and my father actually started to work on the sea when he was fourteen. Uh, so when I became that age, actually a little bit younger. I had also the attraction to the sea and I wanted to be a fisherman, but then uh, my dad gave me the best advice that, you know, you have to choose between football and uh, uh, being a fisherman. And yeah. thankfully I chose uh, to be uh, you know, a football player, although it was on a, uh, a very uh, low level, it was an amateur level, but I really liked football as well. And uh, it was the best advice he ever gave me. Yeah. And it, and it wasn't, it wasn't like the route to the top that lots of, players take when they get picked up at one of the really big Dutch academy clubs it was you know you had to kind of grind and fight for it didn't you from you know the amateur days with quick boys yeah. getting picked up by Utrecht do you think that kind of shaped you as a player that it was almost that that point to prove yeah no I always had uh, that situation that people were judging me that I was not good enough uh, but when I was playing at the youth academy of quick boys again it is an amateur level not bad but it's not professional uh, and I had a few possibilities to to join professional sites, not Ajax, Feyenoord or PSV, but you know other professional sites. 
but uh, my father and mother they they are religious religious so i was not able to play on a sunday uh, because we always go to the church on a sunday so they never wanted me to play at a professional football club um, and then uh, when i was the age of 17 um, there came a, a letter from utrecht and that was the moment my father and mother came to me gave me the letter and they say okay you know um, we know you like football so much and we always made a choice for you not to join any professional sides because we thought you were in the right position at Quick Boys. We didn't want you to play on a Sunday, uh, but now it's you know your own decision. But whatever you will choose, we will support you. So uh, it was a tough decision uh, because you always want to respect your parents, but mm. I decided to, uh, to join Utrecht and they supported me throughout. You know, uh, I was playing on a Sunday, but first my parents go to the church and after they go to the second church was the football stadium. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that that's that's really interesting that you know a lot of the way I was come from a, a, a tough tough area in Garst and Liverpool and, and the humble background that they have, yeah very humble background, helps you. Now whenever I, I watched their play, he ran his socks off from the it was like winding them up. Like a, like a, a <laughs> Duracell buddy, <laughs> it didn't stop, and that's I was like that. What you're seeing is what you got, and he give you everything on the pitch. You know, closing down, never stopping. You know, typical Liverpool. What I watched over the years, and that's what indeed them to the yeah. to the crowd. You know, once they yeah. see someone ready to say the wrong way to say die for the badge and, and whatever, but he was one of them. Mm. You know, yeah. and, and obviously he had the goal scorer and talent to go with it. And that's one reason why he was so loved by the by, by the club. But that humble background for me was very Im imperative to have underneath there because you, you've got this fire in your belly and it doesn't go because the way you've been brought up. And it? that's what my father always learned me that, you know, if you want to achieve something, you'd have to work really, really hard for it. Mm. It doesn't matter what you want to achieve in life. In my case, it was with football. But, you know, working really hard made me achieve many things. And... You know, I was always criticized about, uh, you know, when I was in Holland, I went from Utrecht to Feyenoord and said, oh, probably he will be not good enough. When I went from Feyenoord to the national team, oh, no way he's good enough. Then I went to Liverpool, oh, he's not good enough. Uh, his first touch is not good enough. This is not good enough. But I always, you know, uh, find myself into a better situation. And maybe because I was, you know, uh, in the youth academy of an amateur, on an amateur level, you know, I, I missed something down the road. But... At the other end, you know, it helped me to work just a little bit harder than you know the people around me. Because yeah. when I was 15, I was selected for like the Dutch on the 50 national team. And I remember there were 64 players and they were so much better than me. And by the first selection, I was out. Mm. And I always kept that list. And once, you know, I managed to play in the, the national team of Holland, I watched back that list and there was no one left. There was right. no one of that 64 people who <laughs> made it even to professional football, maybe three or four, yeah. but not on the level I was playing. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, working hard can that, make a big That achievement is brilliant. Yeah. You, get, you yeah. get a sense of pride in yeah, that. Yeah, 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 that's right. It, it makes you really... Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate. Well yeah. done. Yeah. Then so, you come to Liverpool, nine million pounds, and Liverpool being the club that it is, like how did that make you feel from a pressure point of view? Did you feel that pressure? I mean, you just um, indicated people say, oh, you might not be good enough and so on. But did you actually feel that? Because your first season was really impressive, 14 goals. And yeah. So you smashed it really. Yeah. But how did it feel when you joined? Well, I always, the, the bigger the occasion, you know, the better I was feeling myself. You know, I always loved to play derbies, even already in. In Holland, we played Feyenoord Ajax and stuff like that. So the bigger the game, the bigger the occasion, I feel more comfortable. And on one end, you know, people were criticizing me and mostly, you know, people outside the team. Uh, and that makes me, you know, even more hungry to do well, uh, to prove them wrong. But at the other end, you know, the managers I played for, they always, you know, put me... <laughs> Uh, in the team and uh, I just told the story about Bert van Marwijk who always putting me first on the team sheet and it was the same with Rafa he gave me so much confidence I still remember the phone call in 2006 it was just before the World Cup and uh, he said listen uh, sorry to bother you you need to focus on the World Cup I just have one question um, do you want to come to Liverpool I said if you want, I come on the bike from Holland. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry, it can, it can take a bit of time, but we will come and get you. And that confidence a manager gives you, you know, you just explain your situation. Yeah. 
that that gave me so much strength to do well. Uh, and I did I did well the first season. And um, as a striker, you always get judged by your goals. And the first season of Liverpool, I was the club top scorer. Uh, but the second season, you know, I was on my bed in Aruba. And my my sand bed in Aruba I always used to go there on holiday and read the papers. You know. Was the club top scorer relaxing, and then you know a guy called Fernando Torres was just side <laughs> a step off my bat and keep running and be ready. But the point for me was, I think I've scored many goals, important goals. You know, I was a top scorer in Holland, scored some goals in in Liverpool, but also played on many different positions yeah. in every team I played, but also in Liverpool. You know, I play on the ref, left, I play a long time on the right, I play as a second striker. So to and you judge have, me only you, on scoring goals. You could hold the line. You could hold the line as well. Yes. So the four, the four. You, you yeah. played the four positions. Then yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, uh, which which sometimes can be not beneficial, but it is what it is. Mm. You know, just getting a team. But but, but for me, it was it, it yeah. was just like, for me, it was more important to be uh, respected by the team about doing what I was doing than, you know, scoring that one important goal. Oh, yeah. For me, winning was more important. Yeah, than yeah, goals. absolutely, mate. Yeah, absolutely. If, if there is any regrets, is it that that Benitez team you were part of didn't win more trophies because you obviously you had Athens in 2007. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you know, ironically, Liverpool probably were, were better that night than they were in Istanbul a couple of years before. Yeah. But, you know, the things didn't, didn't fall for you as a team. And then obviously 2008-9, the title challenge, just falls a bit short. Um, I, th- that- I think that 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 season, I'm looking at that because we the expectations as fans. Come on, we've got to get the league. We've got to get the league. We were, that year we thought this is it. Yeah. This 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 is it. This mm-hmm. is our moment. That as a fan, that really hurt me. But as a player, you know, under the the extremities of what the fans yeah. want, that must have been so disappointing, wasn't it? Yeah. No, we we were pushing really hard. Um, I think you can compare it with um, with the way Jurgen was building up his team. Um, I think Jurgen was doing really well. Uh, you know, first in the start he needed a bit of time, then he was doing really well, but the team was missing something. And I think the key uh, for Liverpool to win the league was the signing of Allison, the best keeper and the most expensive one at that time, but for me the best keeper in the world. And Virgil van Dijk. Yeah. So these two players were making the difference about just being second or winning the league. And I think that that you know that two pieces Jurgen was missing in the team. When we just came a little bit short on Man United, you know, I, I still remember the days that we were always playing before Man United, and then we were in the plane. United, you know, was down before we took off. Mm. When we landed, they were winning. So mm. we just we we were coming short. And I remember Rafa was saying, I need one or two players you know, to be you know, really ready to compete with them and to make sure we win the league next season. And I think at that moment, the owners decide to, you know, to sell Sabi, to sell Mascarano, instead of keeping them and yeah. add two more players to the squad, because I thought that what our team was, was needing. But you know, that's how football sometimes... Yeah. Uh, so, so playing for Rafa... Obviously, you, you, you felt that, you, you know, especially in Europe, more so the, the way the league was going, you're capable of beating anyone, one in Europe and, 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 yeah. and going on to, to win, you know, the, yeah. the, the Champions League. And, yeah, no, we, we, especially in Europe, we were, yeah, I think, amazing. You know, yeah. we, we were not afraid of any team. Uh, I think any team uh, in Europe was afraid to come to Anfield, but we went to now come to Barcelona, we won. We went to uh, Bernabeu, Real Madrid, we won. We went to Milan, we won. So we were very strong in Europe. And what what some players at the time find difficult that in the beginning, uh, Rafa uh, was relating the team a little bit. And sometimes you didn't know what the team would be. Uh, we used to have bets on guessing the team. <laughs> and no one got it right because there was always a surprise. I remember team. that because yeah. he went so many games. Yeah. It was a record of, of not yeah. playing the same yes. team. Yeah. Rotation was a new yeah. thing then, wasn't it? Yeah. Now it almost feels quite normal yeah. to make yeah, Klopp off and make six or seven changes. So in, yeah. in the beginning, he, he gets criticised that you know that he was changing the team too much. He should be sticking more to you know his best eleven. So we dropped sometimes <clears throat> some points in the beginning, but at the end of the day, during the season, we're getting stronger and stronger. Especially in, in, in Europe, we did some some great things, you know, but. Still remember how we beat Madrid at home. 
Oh, it was four nil game. Yeah, yeah, yeah game. squashed them. Yeah. Uh, Barcelona as well yeah. so uh, yeah great great memories from that it, yeah. it's just from Rafa Benitez's point of view yeah, I just don't and Dirk it, it, it's on it there when he when he when he let Shabby go and our blow our blow went under the same umbrella for three three million our blow went people yeah. forget about our blow it was a good defense he went on to win World Cup and, and Champions League with Madrid and, and, and Maturano that's a big hit you know mm. yeah. that's yeah. a big hit to come back to replace them three players no, and, and I think that was the, that was the sign that when when we started sliding a little yeah. bit, you know. Yeah, well, the the club, you know, from from such heights in those some of those big Champions League nights, the club was a mess really. But under you know with Hicks and Gillette yeah. and the yeah. ownership issues, that that must have been a really tough period as a player when obviously Rafa goes. There's no money to invest in the squad. There's protests. There's all the negativity around yeah. the club. Hodgson comes in. You, know, you think of the Merseyside derby, that horrendous defeat at Goodison. Yeah, and you know, suddenly you've got a Liverpool manager talking about a relegation battle. You must mm-hmm. be thinking, how have we gone from there to yeah. there? Yeah, no, th- th- that's football. Like you know, if if you change a couple of details, and I think you know, what Aldo just saying, you know, you, you lose three very important players, that makes a very big difference in the mm-hmm. team. And if we go back now to the Liverpool team now, actually, it's it's unbelievable how they're doing because we we lost some very important players. You know, Henderson. Um, have done have done so much for the team. Milner, a very important player in and out the pitch. Mm. To replace those guys is not easy. And to see where Liverpool is now at the moment and already had four very tough away games, you know, starting with Chelsea away. They already played Brighton away, yeah. Spurs away, Newcastle away. Yeah. And, you know, still we were just for a couple of seconds yesterday top of the league. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, that, 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 that says a lot about the uh, opportunities of the team. But, uh, yeah, in, in football, it can go so quickly. I see it in Holland now with Ajax. You yeah. Know. Last That's year, crazy, this time, they were saying, oh, Ajax will be for the next 20 years the Bayern München of Holland. And now they are, if they lose today, they play in, in, in a couple of minutes. If they lose, they are bottom of the league. That's great. Yeah, that's that's a that's a ridiculous, yeah. ridiculous thing to know. Yeah, you know, but it's the never, beauty, the beauty about football that, that you it's never like, know like what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Just, that's just so you can see it happen. There's something <laughs> badly wrong there. Yeah. By the way, that's something get yeah. thing get bad. But I mean, Dirk says like that's football. And just yeah. before we go on to the next question, which leads in that direction, <laughs> remember in the last year of Jurgen Klopp at Borussia Dortmund at halftime of the season, Borussia Dortmund was bottom of the league. Mm. Um, so and there was an injury problem, sure, but. But um, the pedigree of the club and Jürgen's leadership ought to have ensured that we are higher. And he ultimately rescued it. But that's just yeah. football. Yeah, but a few details. <laughs> and yeah, you from are a manager's point slide. of view, yeah, yeah, I get that. But Jürgen, whatever went wrong there, he knows that now. Sure. So that, that's when good managers think, well, I can't let that happen again. Yeah. Because I didn't do that and I didn't do that. And that's the reason why we ended up there. So that experience and, and that experience is such important to be from you know moving from a good manager to a top manager, yeah. And that sometimes you know uh, people were speaking very highly about Stevie when he won the league, mm-hmm. but actually with 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 Glasgow. But actually, I think he learned more as a manager at his Villa time <laughs> than at the Rangers yes, time because yeah, things were going well. Yeah. And it's the same with Sabi. You know, he's a great manager. He will only get better and better. But a negative experience is sometimes a positive. A positive. Hundred percent. And then in uh, 2011, January, Hodgson gets replaced by Kenny Daglish, and it seemed like the mood is shifting straight away. And Liverpool very quickly turns into a resurgent force again. In fact, that's this, the the year when you scored your hat trick, the first one since Peter Beardsley against Man United. In I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Everybody. See, that was she a hat trick. Beating Everton is good, but beating Man United is better. <laughs> yeah. You know, it goes back from when I was a. Teenager going towards Liverpool home and away. Yeah. The rivalry was so intense with Liverpool and Man United. And Everton, but the older I got, and because Man United, after we, you know, dominated for, for 20, 30 years, the next minute Alex Ferguson's took them, you know, and it them. And that's when, you know, you, you really, you really want to squash them and beat them or whatever. So I, I was fortunately at that game, that game, I was commentating yeah. for Radio City. So it brought me great joy that day. Uh, How was it to play for Kenny? and? Tell us a bit more about your feelings scoring the hat-trick as well. No, it was uh, great to play under Kenny. Um, of course, I already knew him before. Uh, I remember uh, 
uh, a trip uh, in Asia when he was there as well. Uh, and we did had to do a couple of things together. So we already had a good connection. He came in as a manager and uh, he made things very easy. Um, I think especially the first half season, um, I was playing with Luis, Luis Suarez. He came in the winter break. I think one was, he was one of the best winter signings uh, Liverpool have ever done. Um, and we were playing together and we, you know, we won so many games. I was scoring six games in, in a row. And also, uh, yeah, yeah, I scored a hat-trick against United. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, Kenny also signed some players and one of them was, uh, was Jordan Henderson, uh, who had a great career. But yeah, he was actually the guy who was replacing me a bit because Jordan was starting on the right and I was losing my position and he was playing more up front. So um, at the end of the day, um, I came to the decision to leave uh, Liverpool because of Kenny wasn't playing me as much as I wanted to, mm -hmm. but I still respect him one as a manager, but you know even more as a person. He's 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 a great person and a, a real gentleman, and you know everything. What is Liverpool all about? And still, when I you know I didn't see him yesterday, but whenever we see each other, he invite me over. We have a chat, and just uh, such a great person. And what did it mean to you to finally end that wait for a trophy with Liverpool, that League Cup final at, yeah. at Wembley against Cardiff? Because obviously you come on. You score, you score again in, in the shootout. And I remember waiting around for interviews for ages after. I think you were the last player off the pitch. Yeah. You were, it, was, it felt like that meant so much to you. Yeah, because, you know, you come to Liverpool to win trophies. Mm -hmm. And um, we just discussed our team. And I think we were very successful. We had great results against, against the biggest side in Europe. But eventually, you know, I became second in the Premier League. Uh, became second. Uh, we lost the FA Cup final. Uh, we, we lost the Champions League final. And then, you know, I knew I was leaving Liverpool and at least you want to leave the club with, a, you know, some silverware with a trophy. So, I, although it was the Carling Cup, for me, it was a really important one. Yeah. And afterwards, you know, I started thinking by myself, OK, you know, I didn't win as much as I wanted to win at Liverpool, but this club really made me a win, um, a win player, because after I left, you know, Liverpool, you know, I started to win things. I went to Fenerbahce, mm. you know, we won uh, the, the league for for the first time since a long period. Uh, we won the cup, we won the Super Cup. Then I went back to Feyenoord in the first season, we won the cup as well. And then I finished my career um, with winning the league after eight years with Feyenoord. So, you know, not winning so many things at Liverpool, yeah, didn't feel you know, satisfying, but after my career, look back, you know, this time at Liverpool made me really the player I wanted to be. Yeah, and scoring a hat-trick to win the title with yeah. Feyenoord, that must have almost been the dream way to sign off. It? Yeah, no, it is, you know, we, we can talk about, you know, mentality and quality, uh, but it, at the end of the day, sometimes in life, you just need a little bit of luck. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because you have to week, take that look at the same time when yeah. you're given it, yeah. Because the week before, because I was I was retiring, I knew I was retiring, and the week before uh, Heracles, that was the last game of the season, we played Excelsior, uh, and the the last games of the season, I wasn't in the first eleven. So the coach Giovanni Fabroncos, he put me on the bench. So I knew I would be on the bench against Excelsior. Excelsior was the team who was already relegated. They were bottom of the league, and we were just going there to just to be the champion. If we won that game, we would be champion. And suddenly we're getting beat 3 0. Mm. Impossible in my way. Yeah. Nobody, you know, even thought of that. And in the last five minutes, the guy who was playing in my position gets a yellow card and he was suspended for the last game. Or else I wasn't even playing the last game of the season. <laughs> so that's what I say. We can talk about <laughs> tactics, yeah. details, Fate. quality. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, you need a little bit of luck. Absolutely, man. Life. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is All Though Meets podcast with Deck Out. James Peace and Peter Schiltenhausen. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and you're closer to the ultimate play prize. One nil defeat to Spain in the 2010 World Cup. Oh, that's a that's a killer, that name. There was a killer, it is, isn't it? Yeah. But that's I, you must be proud of that. Pal. That, that's well, it's, it's it's my you know together with the Champions League final, yeah. your biggest highlight in your career, but also on the other end, your biggest disappointment. Yeah, yeah, because, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you you want to win things, and the second doesn't feel you know as as, as winning something, although it's a, a big achievement for a country like Holland. Wow. But we were so close to uh, to win it, you know. Uh, World Cup finals, what we, you. World Cup, you know, dream, dream about World, but World Cup final. We got the quarterfinal. That's the best we did. Yeah. The final, the disappointment that went with that. Yeah. Like, oh, it must have been horrible. And and you know, we Dutch men always will be remembered by the possibility Iron Robber had, and you know, he had Casillas with his so taking out the ball, or else yeah. we would probably won it. Yeah, very unlucky, but uh, yeah, still good memories. Oh, proud, you yeah. proud memories. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Did you miss playing? Well, people always say, are oh, you missing playing? I think, you know, to be on the pitch, uh, to be able to do what you love most every week in, week out. Uh, of course you miss it, but I like to look back that I was very privileged that I had the opportunity to do so. So I look back to a great career, played for great teams, you know, I'm still in very good contact with Feyenoord, Utrecht, even Fenerbahce, but all, even, even more Liverpool. And, you know, I, I look back to something great and looking forward to the, to the future. So not really missing it. I'm just, you know, really thankful that uh, I had the opportunity to, to have that life. And I know when you were at Liverpool, you liked to go out in town on a Saturday night and, and wine, socialise. Do you think that, that kind of generation you were part of was almost the last generation that were able to do that? Because we don't, don't really see that now. And it's obviously a lot more difficult with camera phones and yeah. social media. I, it, it, it made it uh, makes it more difficult and you know back in the days when I was playing for Liverpool I lived in in, in Walton down yeah. the road and not only me Lucas Leva was was living there Pepe Reina uh, Luis Suarez Fernando Torres, Torres there, Garcia yeah. so we were all you know located in the center of Liverpool mm. and we always used to go um, you know out for a drink or for dinner you know yesterday I went with my son to San Carlos that was always the place where I used to come with my family or with my friends. But nowadays it's impossible for the Liverpool yeah. players because, of course, you know, these guys need to relax sometimes as well. They want to have a good glass of wine or a couple of beers and sometimes a little bit too much. But nowadays, you know, the cameras are on and they're making you know, things very big. Uh, and I don't think the players like it anymore to be in that you know, situation. And it's, it's, it's a bit of a shame because I think players are still human beings and they also need to mm. relax sometimes yeah. or having a good night out Absolutely, like we, yeah. we did back in the days. Absolutely, yeah. The Dutch connection. So obviously these days at Liverpool, we've got like a proper strong spine there with Van Dijk, Gakpo, yeah. Gravenberg there. I mean, you mentioned earlier Van Dijk was arguably one of the two missing pieces that led from Liverpool to go second to top. But how how important do you reckon like this Dutch connection is for, for Liverpool now? Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy with, uh, with the players who are there now. You know, Grafenberg, I think yesterday played, especially the first half, a great game. Mm. And he's still such a young player. So uh, I think he's a big plus for the team. Uh, it makes me very proud that Virgil is the captain. Uh, now, what he had done for Liverpool is amazing, but to be the captain now of the team is great. And he had a bit of, you know, critics, mm -hmm. uh, not only here in Liverpool, but also in Holland. But for me, he's still one of the you know, best defenders in the world. And people forget sometimes that it was not easy to come back after a very serious injury, you know, back to the level you want to be, especially when the team, you know, is not performing, you know, the way they did before all eyes were on him. Uh, it was the same, not only in Liverpool, but also at the national team. And I watched every game of Liverpool so far, and I think he has done, you know, very well. Uh, not many mistakes. I think he was very unlucky with the, the red card against uh, uh, Newcastle. Um, and also, I have to say, it's not easy for him uh, that he played alongside a lot of different players. So, you know, Kanate was playing yesterday. I think he was lucky not to get the red card. Uh, uh, Matip was playing there, Gomez was playing there. So at the end of the day, you also need like a kind of partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, but it feels like, you know, also in defense, Liverpool is getting more comfortable, although they're conceding a lot of goals, too many in my opinion. But Virgil 
is doing very well. A lot of respect for him. And we forget about Wijnaldum, but he was also, you know, he, he's he done some great things for Liverpool. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, didn't, things didn't go well after he left. But I think he was such an important player in the, the successful time. With, uh, Contributed his goals as well during that time. In a weird way, if you look at Man City now and why it's not... I know they are right up there, but it doesn't feel quite as invincible as they used to. And I feel like Gundogan leaving there might be a similar hope. element that they we, lost, like yeah, Liverpool can, did with Ronaldo. Hope, but it, it looks like there might be a couple of chinks in the armour. Exactly. But, but I want to ask a couple of things about, about we're talking about the Dutch players. And, um, first of all, Gabko. Um, a young, young, people don't realise he's very young. Yeah. And I've, I've read a lot about, you know, his mannerisms and, and his respect about, about football and the way he's... Lanes and he's doing what we did. Or he's training, working hard on his own game. He's very intelligent. Where do you think goals, goals wise? What do you think personally is maximum he could get a season for Liverpool? I know it's a bit tough now because you, you know it does rotate a little bit. But he's going to get the best part of 25, 30 games starting, and and the other coming on as substitutions in the season. So it's hard to judge. But do you think he could he could get twenty goals a season? I, I think in the future he, he can manage to do so and you know he, he arrived uh, at a difficult time. I, I think it's never easy to join a club uh, in, in a winter break. Um, just speaking about Suarez who did extremely well but there are not many players who were getting to a team so quickly and when he came in the winter break uh, Liverpool especially up front had some injuries so Jurgen had to play him straight into the team. And that's what I always say to you know people who are judge players straight away. I remember when I came to the Premier League, I dropped like six, seven, eight kilos of weight in the first couple of months because the intensity of the league is so high. Yeah. You know, you are yeah. used to the Eredivisie, but something totally different than the Premier League. So players need to adapt and need to have some time. And even last season, Gakpo showed some really quality moments with great goals. And also sometimes people were saying, oh, we expect a little bit more from him. And people forget that he's still at a young age, but once he finds his, you know, his position in the team and he's playing 30, 35 games, yeah. I can think he he can be a 20 plus goal scorer. And, and that we had a little talk earlier on before the podcast. Uh, I was intrigued because I've been watching Graven Birch, um, who's who's you know just come to the club again, very young, and you're watching him. He looks like he's about 25 years of age. Yeah. He just he looks very mature. And watched him at the, yesterday. The, the first twenty minutes at the derby, he was sensational. He was yeah. absolutely brilliant. So we know what he's got. But then, it, the times I've seen him, he tires. You know, an awful lot. You can see him tired. Doesn't get involved in the game. And you, 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 you told me I want you to tell the podcast and your your thoughts about that because I thought it was intriguing and you were yeah. spot on about it. The reason being, yeah, no, like like again, he just come to the club. He's one of the most talented players uh, from Holland. Uh, I think, you know, he has a great career in front of him. He had a transfer to Bayern München, didn't work out, didn't get many games. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you get the opportunity to play for Liverpool on the Jurgen Klopp. Totally different style of playing. And people forget that if you're not playing for a season, you have to find your rhythm. So what you saw the first half was what was Gravenberg is all about. He's a great player, like to move forward, forward passes. But after 45 minutes, he got a little bit tired. Mm. And I think you can even compare it with Thiago. You know, remember when he came to uh, to Liverpool and he had to play in the intensity of the of the Premier League, and he was already at that time one of the best midfielders in the world, but still struggled a little bit in the yeah. beginning. And then you compare it with Gravenberg now. I think he is ahead of what Thiago was doing in his beginning yeah, in yeah, Liverpool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just need to get used to it. And I think Jurgen is doing very well to give him some couple of minutes, let him play in the uh, uh, UEFA League or Euro League, uh, give him a start now, chase him after 60 minutes. And I think after three months, you know, he will can go forever because his engine, his physical strength is one of his qualities as well. So I'm sure, you know, we have a lot of joy of uh, the, the potential. I, I agree. The potential I've seen, it, it could be excellent. I think he could be, at a, as we call it, a dark horse. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in years to come, hopefully, hopefully so. You know. Yeah. Time for the quiz. 
Oh Joe, yeah, yeah. Go for um, it. But before the quiz, I'd like to thank you, Dave, for yeah. coming. It's been it's been brilliant. Very happy great to be to here. See you, good to see you again. And you look looking forward over to there. the next legend game. Let's hope. Uh, yes, I, I would love to see you play one more time because it's been oh, a Jesus little Christ, bit. Uh, I don't want to really see that. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, you fall over the last. Time. <laughs> you see me playing at the bar. We'll have a couple. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't know. We'll have a knock about in the bar. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully, your son. Yeah. He's a lovely lad. We met yeah. him. Met him behind the scenes and he can replicate what you've done mate we'll look forward to seeing yeah. another young cow playing for Liverpool in years to come but we do before you go um, we always do a little bit of a laugh bit of a quiz yeah. and it's about your career okay, okay. Um, who's lead at the no Steve Nichol had a nightmare didn't he he only got he got lost crazy didn't he <laughs> <laughs> Jamie. We had to do an action Jamie replay with Steve yeah. because he, he was adamant that he said bands yeah, when he did. never. No. But, so, yeah. but by the way, you had to give credit credit to him. But he had five pints. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great lad, Steve. Steve, you're watching. Yeah. Love you, pal. So, so yeah, cool. James. Right. Oh, where are you going, Dirk, mate? number one, you made your Liverpool debut off the bench against West Ham in August 2006. Liverpool won 2 1. Who got the winning goal that day? Daniel Egger. Peter Crouch. Oh, and Daniel was the first goal, no? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. From long distance. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that half a point? Uh, yeah, we can half give him a half of that. Yeah. Number two, <laughs> you scored your first goal for Liverpool a month later against Newcastle. Who delivered the cross for you to score? Well, it was Sabi Alonso who gave the pass to the, the right. The, the fullback, mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, what was it? Steve Finnan? Yeah, Correct. well done, mate. Correct. Well done, lad. Well done. Number three, you famously scored the winning penalty against Chelsea in the Champions League semi-final shootout at Anfield 2007. Which Chelsea player had crucially missed just Ooh. before you stepped up to score? Iron Robin. Oh, that's Jeremy. That's oh, a tough one. But Robin missed as well, no? Did he? Maybe that was early. Was that earlier on in the shootout? Was it? Okay. Yeah, I think so. That's a tough Half one. Point. I, I would have <laughs> got that. One. I'd never have got that. Number one. four, which fellow Dutchman did Liverpool sign from Ajax? A year after you arrived at Liverpool? Ryan Babel. Correct. Number five, you came off the bench to help Liverpool win the League Cup against Cardiff in 2012 at Wembley. Which striker did you replace that day? Bellamy? Andy Carroll. Oh, really? <laughs> I, I, I was just some some clips yesterday, you know, when we won it, and I saw Bellamy on the bench. So. Uh, and finally, number six, against which club did you score your final Liverpool goal? Was it Wolves? QPR. Oh, QPR. Ah, oh, that's bad. Yeah. You're still <laughs> <laughs> Wolves still was my last game, and, and answer too quick. So. <laughs> still much better than Steve. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dave. Yeah. This has been all those podcasts in conjunction with the Hotel Anfield. Uh, and we look forward to our next guest, which we're not letting you know just at the moment. Uh, but in the meantime, top man, thanks for your time. Well done, pal. Cheers. Thanks, and, and Cheers. thanks for coming. From, to from, from sorry, I meant, forgot to mention me and my old mate here, <laughs> James Pierce and Peter Schitter. <laughs>